Endurance riding is a special kind of sport. It's not a race. It's man and beast pitting their strength and skill against the elements. To complete the ride is to win. The Scone 200 is one of the longest endurance rides in New South Wales. It replaces the Winton to Longreach Stockman's Hall of Fame ride, which was discontinued after the bicentenary. It's hoped the ride will draw attention to the Equine Research Centre, which is to be built in Scone. 44 of the state's best long-distance riders and horses lined up for the start of the event. All eyes were on local girl Joanna Preston, an unknown in the endurance circle until last year, when she and her horse Finland Park Rosienti, or Chook for short, claim both the Winton to Longreach and state championship. On the stroke of midnight, they were off. Ahead of them, 200 kilometres of mountainous country. The terrain the riders will be covering these two days is inaccessible to vehicles, and only at four checkpoints along the way will the riders and horses have a chance to rest. Despite the bitter cold and muddy conditions, the horses made good time for the first checkpoint. Here, it is crucial that both rider and horse pass a physical. The competitor is weighed at each station to ensure they are carrying no less than 73 kilograms. The horse is given half an hour to cool down and its heartbeat and respiration is then taken. If the vet finds that the animal is strained or lame, it's immediately disqualified from the event. This heart rate was uh, 46 and that's okay. Respiration rate 12, that's fine. And there's no sign of lameness and it's not stressed at all, so it's right to go on. Okay. Each competitor has a support team of at least four people. In the rest periods, the horse must be kept warm and the rider's spirit maintained. On the trail, it's just the two of them, with only a torch to find their way. It's great, actually. It's um, great because the moon was out for the first half of it and you could see where you were going, so you didn't need a torch. But once the moon went down, we really had to have our torches on all the way, otherwise you missed the arrows. But it was well marked as long as you kept your arrows up and it was good, it was boggy in a couple of little patches but basically it was very, very good. It's three o'clock in the morning, all the horses and riders have passed through the first checkpoint. They tell me the morning frost is setting in and from now until dawn is the coldest part of the night. For the riders it's the most difficult. They've got to leave the warmth of the fire and get back on their horse, knowing that ahead of them lies 160 kilometres of rugged country. Most of the material in this exhibition comes from the Greek colonies in southern Italy. The show features fine examples of Hellenic pottery, red-figured vases, statuettes and small reliefs. You can buy this two and a half thousand year old vase for ten thousand dollars. Or if the budget won't stretch that far, a small pottery dish from an indigenous Italian tribe for one hundred and fifty. Clearly, the Italians who fashioned these pieces paid no heed to the adage, you can't take it with you. They are all items that have been buried with, with people as um, a means of buying their way through into a heaven or as, as an indication of, of who these people were in society. Although some of the pieces date back to 550 BC, they remain in remarkable condition. A fortunate result of their entombment alongside Italian nobility. Some of them are very, very fragile, as you can see, but also some of them haven't, the, the glazing process hasn't been vitrified, and so it's like a, an ochre painted on the top, and they're very, very fragile, so that um, there's no way that those sort of items would have survived if they're open to the elements. With a howling westerly wind blowing, it was difficult to get any real rhythm going in the early part of the match, but when Australs went forward, they looked dangerous. Mark Elric was showing some great skill close to the penalty box and nearly put Australs in the lead after 20 minutes. And with a home team dominating proceedings, tempers flared during the first half after some heavy tackling. But right on half time, the game was broken wide open by that man Elric, as again he worked his way inside, and it was the number 14, Dean McGuetta, who squeezed the ball home. In the second minute of the second half, the best move of the match. McWhorter battled hard for the ball, got it back to Kevin Schill, who gave a delightful through ball to Brett Porter, and he made no mistake to put Austral's two goals up. 
Rockdale then started to play some enterprising football, going close on a couple of occasions, and finally got on the board when Michael Bugard was pinged for handball, and from the penalty, Stuart Porter made no mistake to make the final score, Australs 2, Rockdale 1. The 56 guides from Port Macquarie in the north to Port Hacking in the south set up camp alongside the airstrip for the two-day Women in Aviation course. After a brief run through the plane's basic functions, the girls were strapped in for the final section of the course, a 30-minute flight across the central coast. Despite strong winds, the planes took off. Once airborne, it was time to begin taking notes on the plane's airspeed, altitude and engine capabilities while still admiring the view. And there were butterflies all round as the planes came in for some tricky landings in the strong winds. It's two years since the Able Tasman was in Newcastle and it returned today for survey maintenance and refurbishment. The 19,000 ton vessel normally runs between Devonport, Tasmania and Melbourne, but it's left the colder waters of Bass Strait to spend the next fortnight in Newcastle. The ferry's lucrative maintenance contract, valued at more than half a million dollars, was awarded to Forjax Engineering, which won the contract over Sydney's Garden Island. Passengers disembarked at number four West Basin and there were some emotional dockside reunions as Novocastrians returned to their home shores. <laughs> But the majority, mostly Tasmanians, set off on a mainland sightseeing tour, planning to return to the ferry for its departure at the end of the month. by the Nelson Bay boys to get this far in the competition and today they were up against a school steeped in rugby history. But it was well into the first half that Kings conjured up their first try. And after some scrappy play, it was fullback Tim Eddy who crashed over. He promptly converted his own try and by adding a penalty made the half-time score 9-0. With the Bays being cheered on by a large group of spectators and three budding commentators, Damien Cooper, Andrew Affleck and Kelvin Kong, they lifted their game and put on some enterprising moves. Little chip there, but Jace is there to cover. Gets the bounce and he's going to run. He's not going to kick. He's Jace elected to run. run. The first Steps in. Oh, oh, wrong person. Nice pass. Oh. But Vince, he meets Vince and that's a brick wall. Yeah, he hit but Vince. But the greater experience of the Kings and their superior pack took the pressure and added more points from a good backline move that had breakaway Cameron Higgins going in to score. The final score, Kings 28, Nelson Bay nil. devoted Newcastle Knights supporters went by train to watch their favourite team go round and to while away the hours to Campbelltown, a touch of jazz for music and a sandwich or two washed down with some of the best. Even on arrival it was like being at the International Sports Centre with the entourage being met by the White Knight. But inside on the muddied field it was far from a happy ending as competition points went. The Knights suffered a major blow when informed front rower Mark Sargent went down with what appeared like a broken leg and he was carried from the field. 
Back in Newcastle today, however, Dr John Sage cleared Sergeant of any break and it was a relieved footballer who hobbled from the surgery. Yeah, well he's cleared me of any fracture or any, um, any ligament damage. There's apparently just a um, pretty heavy bruising around the, around the lower leg, so that's a relief. By losing Sergeant and his front row partner Peter Johnson in the first half, it allowed Western Suburbs to run right. And it was Danny Peacock who made the break, gave a good pass inside to Jason Stafford, who delivered to the Black Pearl Ellery Hanley and the Magpies crossed for their first try. In the second half it was that man Hanley again, who this time gave the final pass to Wayne Simons and the little winger made no mistake to put the issue beyond doubt. But the loss and the possibility of missing a place in the finals couldn't dampen the spirits of the supporters as they sang themselves hoarse on the way home. Took off the Saunders from Saturday's test win with a solid session on Newcastle number two, the venue for Wednesday's clash with Country. Throughout the run, the Lions displayed plenty of ball work, speed, and the ability to produce a solid knock. Ironically, the Lions touring captain 100 years ago never made it back to England. He tragically died in a boating accident on the Hunter River. Today, team officials paid respect to Robert Snedden at his grave in the Campbell Hill Cemetery near Maitland. He summed up what rugby union football is all about, that you think that a person who died a hundred years ago uh, on, a, on a Lions tour, and they still, the grave stone was so well kept and, uh, and the memory was still there. However, man cannot live on football alone, and today's Brits enjoyed the hospitality of Wyndham Estate, spending the afternoon relaxing and sampling. Milk vendors were told in June their bottled milk could be phased out if sales didn't increase. Dairy Farmers claims there has been no significant increase and unless things change, bottled milk may become a thing of the past. Certainly if the sales trend continues on the way that it is, the, the glass milk bottle is an unviable proposition to continue packaging. A decision will be made next month. He says sales would have to double to keep bottled milk economically viable. Milk is only bottled at Dairy Farmers three days a week over a four to five hour period. It's claimed that's costly, with machinery needing maintenance and staff to be carried. If the milk bottles are phased out, some of Dairy Farmer's 76 jobs might go. Could you say by how much that number might have to be reduced if these milk bottles were taken out? We're not looking at a great number, probably in the order of four to five. While that's not likely to prove popular with staff, milk vendors are also unhappy with the proposal to scrap bottled milk. Well, it forces on the consumer an immediate increase in the price of milk. Now, the industry has saw fit recently to decrease the price of milk, and if they eliminate the glass bottle, then the alternate package is five cents dearer for the same amount of milk. Mr Arbour also argues in favour of recycling glass bottles to protect the environment, and says phasing out bottled milk will cost vendors money. He says consumers' decisions on the type of milk they buy will decide the fate of bottled milk. If bottles are phased out and consumers show that they don't want glass bottles, that is the end of the line. Glass bottles won't be around.
Western in 1884, Veronica Phillips has seen a lot in her 105 years. And today, members of her close-knit family were only too happy to help celebrate another birthday. Among them, former Lake Macquarie alderman and local identity Desley Shakespeare. How many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren has she got? Well, here we go. She's got uh, <coughs> three, three children. She had three children. Uh, amongst them, they had nine. Then there were 17, that's great-grandchildren, 19 great-great, and she has one great-great-great. So, <laughs> she's populated Australia. For much of her life, Mrs Phillips lived in the Hunter. At 20, she married horse breeder Stephen Phillips at the Sacred Heart Church in Hamilton. For a brief time during the Depression, the couple worked on a sheep station in Queensland. Mrs Phillips cooked, helping to pay her children's way through school. At 75, she took up bowling, but her earlier passion was music. Yes, she played for the silent movies for quite a number of years. She had her own orchestra. Mrs Phillips shared her birthday today with great-great-granddaughter Kylan Dominic from Raymond Terrace and another great-granddaughter in Wollongong. But it really was Veronica Phillips' day. Coach Ken Cole uh, didn't pull any punches in describing last weekend's oh, performance yeah. as one of the worst he'd been associated with, but at the same time praised the efforts of the resurgent oh, yeah, Tigers. Yeah. At Boondall Stadium tomorrow Clark night, the Falcons meet the Bullets, the who are having an ordinary Never season now, with a record of seven wins and seven losses. The, the Bullets are hit by internal strife, uh, and Cole fills the Falcons to pull off a major upset. Tomorrow night at the Broadmeadow Stadium, the Kennard Hunters are at home. In local rugby league this weekend, two good matches tonight, and then on Sunday, Central, South and Curry clash with Wests, Waratah and North Nelson Bay, respectively. The top three teams in Newcastle Rugby Union have relatively easy matches in Series 16. University Wanderers and Merriweather Carlton should consolidate their positions at the top of the table. Another two rounds of Newcastle men's hockey will be played over the weekend, and if the weather holds for a couple of weeks, the competition will be back on schedule. And Newcastle Australs are away this Sunday to Wollongong, Macedonia, and Australs will be out to make it three wins on the trot. The first clash in March of this year will be remembered as the Battle of Leichhardt with the infamous Gary Freeman eye-gouging incident now part of rugby league history. And after the Knights were reduced to 10 men at one stage, they still just failed by only two points to pull off a remarkable victory. For the Newcastle Knights line-up that will take on the Balmain Tigers here tomorrow at the International Sports Centre is vastly different from the side that played the Tigers in round one. Out of the side of the three Kiwi internationals, Sam Stewart, James Goulding and Tony Kemp, and also out of the side of Mark Sargent, Peter Johnston, Mike McKinnon, Robbie McCormack, Glenn Miller and Glenn Friendo. But Alan McMahon still feels this young side will give the Tigers one hell of a shake. Well, this is a game that um, is going to be a big test of character to the guys that run out there. Balmain's replacements are, are very strong and have played some very good football against Canberra and of course against North Sydney. But one, one of the biggest things that I think our particular side has and going for it, and I'm sure it will be evident again tomorrow, is the fact that there won't be any surrenders. The lead-up match to the Tigers' Knights fixture is the first schoolboys test between Australia and Great Britain, and today both teams were given a civic reception at the City Hall. And as you would expect on the eve of such a big match, they carefully kept at arm's length, with the Aussie lads asked not to mix until tomorrow night, socially that is. Bristling with talent and experience, the Great Britain team will be a handful for Australia, but Newcastle players Steve Storry and Shane Mackley are confident of a win. But at 3 o'clock tomorrow, the main focus of attention will switch to the Newcastle Knights to see if they can hang on to their chances of making the finals for 1989. At the International Sports Centre for NBN News, I'm Mike Rabbit. that Lake Macquarie Council was considering a development application to open an escort agency spread quickly through Belmont. Today, residents launched a campaign to prevent the agency opening in offices above a local shopping centre. The protest received strong support from shopkeepers and adjoining premises who fear for their businesses, but others were thinking of their families. 
We don't want our children to to be subject to something like this. It's also going to bring violence into the area, things like that, the sort of thing that a family doesn't need. Protest organiser Greg Swain can't believe the applicants are serious. We have five schools within one kilometre of here. We have five family restaurants within uh, 150 metres from here. Um, we have uh, senior citizens' homes. We have kindergartens. I mean, it's totally irresponsible by the applicant to even consider that we would uh, be quiet over this issue. Well, this is to become the doorway to Lake Macquarie's first escort agency. But even in these enlightened times, that may be something of an understatement. According to the application, the entire upper floor is to become a personal, professional and discreet parlour. And that may be a bit more than council bargained for. Mayor Ivan Welsh attended the meeting. He says the proposal meets the letter of the law, but it's unlikely to proceed. If it was just an agency with one room and and a telephone, you could understand that it wouldn't cause such a, a stir, but that's exactly what it's not. It's a number of rooms, it's the whole floor of that building, and that's a, a fairly large uh, office, if you like. In the meantime, the residents are wasting no time gathering support for their cause, some even turning to prayer. God, it is disgusting in your sight, and we're going to stand up against it in the name of Jesus Christ and say, we don't care who you have influenced on that council, we don't care what But if heavenly powers alone aren't enough, the protesters are also collecting a petition which they hope will sway the minds of earthly powers in Lake Macquarie City Council. Tom Hilston for NBN News. Customers attending the presentation were told the port has experienced a 3% reduction in operational costs for the year, affected by staff cuts and improved efficiency. However, the port's income was $10 million less this year compared with last. And while more than 28 million tonnes of coal was exported during the past financial year, that was well below budget. The coal industry has had some difficulties uh, in implementing its structural efficiency uh, changes and there has been a big impact on wet weather. Uh, coal exports are substantially down on last year. Production, however, is expected to lift. Mr Connell said a report has also been prepared to look at exporting chilled and frozen meat from the port, with market opportunities expected in Japan and Korea. Investigations are also underway to use the port as a major important distribution centre for timber, with possibly one shipment coming into the port each fortnight. The port now has received six trial shipments of imports of timber, and that process is working well. It's a new trade that we've been able to, not a new trade, but a trade returning to the port, and uh, we think that's got a big future. Mr Connell says a study has also been completed on recreational boating and expressions of interest will soon be called for from potential developers. He says a southern area near Stockton Bridge might be available as a site for a marina sooner than another potential site at Throsby Creek. The Throsby site is constrained by the existing oil berth. We will be building a new oil berth on Kurigang Island. It won't be operational till January 91, so the site really there is constrained and therefore the interest might now be seen to be in the Stockton site.